Hello, and welcome to the Modern Romantic Podcast, where we celebrate romanticism through many creative outlets and passionate people doing some amazing things. Hello, I'm legally not al allowed to talk about who I am. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm Trey, uh, and I'm joined by my co-host, Emily. Hi, Emily. Hello. I am... <laughs> I don't know what I'm legally allowed to do now. <laughs> I'm legally allowed to talk about me, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Okay. Uh, well, the people who we are legally allowed to talk about and who I'm really excited to get into is our guest for today's episode. Uh, Emily, would you mind introducing our fantastic guest today? Absolutely. Today we have someone who is a visual storyteller, an illustrator, and now an author. I'd like to introduce artist Sean Fitzgibbon. Yay! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just imagine like a 30 piece orchestra behind you, just like. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> well, that's that's normally what happens whenever, you know, an introduction's for me, but, you know, I, I usually don't have to imagine, you know. It's, no, I'm serious. There's confetti falling from the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, yeah. It's like on, yeah. When you back a Kickstarter project where a confetti pops out, it's like, it's like that. It's just weird. <laughs> Magical confetti. What a wonderful life to have. <laughs> I know. It's weird. It's so weird. It gets annoying sometimes. Too. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, up, you in... do them. Oh, sorry. The oh, cleanup. You wake is... up. Sorry, Trey. <laughs> That's no go. Hey, this always happens. Like you wake up, you do the most mundane thing, and it's just like. Oh, I woke up. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> well, it's like on you, you remember on Seinfeld, like every every scene change, it's like that slapping bass, like mm. bah, 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 bah. it's like that, but it's like a full piece orchestra, you know? It's weird. I'm like, what is this? You know? <laughs> Your life theme music. All right. It's like, oh, there it is again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sean, I, I definitely want to get into the book that you've created. Um, it looks incredible. The art is phenomenal from what I've been able to see. Um, but I really want to get into that a little bit later. But for yeah. those, um, for our audience who may not be um, very well versed in some of your work, would you mind kind of telling us a little bit about um, how you became this visual storyteller, how you became now a graphic novelist, um, and so on? Yeah, I absolutely. Um, so I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, my uh, I'm originally from Missouri, from Southwest Missouri. My my uh, parents were big influences. My dad's actually an artist. They live in Springfield, Missouri now. But he's a he uh, he was actually my high school art teacher, <laughs> um, and uh, still does art. You know, and he's always he's he's does uh, commission work and whatnot. But um, so I grew up, you know, really spending a lot of time in, in his studio, you know, just and I always had art supplies readily available, you know, like uh, I, I just grew, I thought all kids like had sketchbooks and paint and, and uh, just pretty much anything I needed. I always had, you know, it was almost like I, I had my own uh, uh Hobby Lobby or Dick Blick or whatever you you know whatever mm -hmm. art place you had like you know at my disposal you know like I had a uh, I was uh, yeah so I always had supplies and uh, and I was just always just being around art and like I said he was a he taught you know he was a high school art teacher most of my, you know, growing up and so I he would take his students to the nearby like. Uh, Museums, which there was the Philbrook in Tulsa and the Nelson Adkins Art Museum in uh, Kansas City, which that they're both wonderful museums. Um, and so I would, he would, I would tag along, you know, like when they would go on these, when he would take like his art club or art students on these field trips, you know, and, and uh, so I kind of just grew up just with art not, not not just you know being around an artist but also just kind of going to museums you know and, and uh i really kind of developed this at an early age kind of a a, a love for art history yeah. and although i didn't really know much about art history until like once i'm in college like of course then you're taking art history courses and it really solidifies all that but i had this love of just visually 
you know, consuming all that at, growing up. And so by the time in college, I'm like, oh yeah, I know that. I know. And then you're just kind of learning about it. And so it was like really crystallized all that, you know, and, and, and uh, and then um, as far as like my mother, my mom's a, uh, she, um, I, she, she was all growing up. I mean, and she still is as well. Like that she loves old films. And so I would watch a lot of old movies with her and uh, um, a lot of kind of mystery, noir, nah, kind of, uh, yeah, like Hitchcock. Like she introduced me to like Hitchcock and I've always been a big fan of, of Alfred Hitchcock films and and uh, and now I mean that's grown into like all kinds of different types of films. Um, like I said, we're I'm big Criterion film, which Criterion Channel is wonderful. If any of you, if you ever watch the Criterion Channel, it's amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, and so I always just I, I grew up watching a lot of old films like that, and uh, and you know, and, and it was it wasn't until probably. Well, and then, and so I was also a fan of like storytelling. I loved, I loved, I always wanted to kind of marry my love of storytelling and like films and art. So as a kid, I, I really loved Disney, like Disney animation, because that was, to me, that was a way of doing that. But then by the time uh, I was a high school kid, I learned about, or I kind of started seeing, that was okay. So that would have been in the 80s. And that was around the time where comics, I, I kind of, the whole comics scene was sort of like comics were growing up, you know, in a way like that was when Alan Moore's Watchmen and Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One and, and uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse and uh, all these great, these seminal sort of graphic novels were coming about. And I was like, huh, you know, that that's a, a medium where I don't have to draw the same thing over and over again where 24 frames equal one second of, of right. you know and and i can just tell it with a sequence of panels and it's still like a film it's like film on paper and uh so that was around you know when i was in high school like i said and then by the time i got into college like i said i was really um you know, still had that in my mind, you know, that I wanted to always kind of do the marriage of those two, my love of art, art history, and then film. And, and uh, I moved to, uh, so anyway, I, I went to the school in uh, New Jersey for a while. It was kind of this illustration type school while I was uh, kind of in the middle of my undergrad. I go to this school, come back, finish my undergrad, and then I moved to, uh, and during this time, I'm kind of working on uh, sort of a dark, true crime, not true crime, but a crime noir kind of comic type. It's a graphic novel sort of thing. It's pen and ink, kind of, you know, just sort of a traditional pen and ink sort of a noir kind of a thing. And uh, and then I go to grad school around 2003 and... Uh, um, I'm, you know, working on my thesis and at the same time I'm working on this book and, and I'm also doing gallery work and I always wanted to kind of combine. So my gallery works more painterly and more mixed media. Okay. And I always wanted to combine that sort of painterly mixed media work with tell, storytelling, telling stories. And so I ended up sort of doing that with my, my newest book, my newest series. And so I kind of, that was kind of a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> no, that that's, that's perfect. So we, the reason I'd like to ask that question is, especially with some of our uh, most recent guests, like one of the photographers that we had is a former Arabic translator. Then he switched careers and became something else. And um, we get to see this nice progression of, people mm -hmm. throughout and how they came into their artistic fruition mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. in terms of like mixed mediums um what do you like to work with is it like paint or do you like to work with more um oil-based acrylics are you like throw anything out of canvas and um and work with that or what do you like to work with Okay, well, I would say drawing is always the backbone of my work. I'm also an adjunct art professor and I teach uh I teach a lot of drawing courses as well as like illustration and 
And I also teach smart appreciation classes and just basic studio courses. But um, drawing's the backbone, but I also like working in water media as well as like so like watercolor, but I also like uh, um you know, when I say mixed media, like I mean literally coll- I will like collage and then draw on top of that, paint and draw. I got I'm literally like mixing media, you know, like I'm literally uh doing that i love this sort of sense of i love layering Mm -hmm. um so when i was in graduate school i spent some time i well i actually did a summer semester over in uh in italy over in rome um and uh during that time i was doing all these i was loading my sketchbook up with all these you know drawings and i was also painting in my sketchbook and i was also uh combining that with i was uh like all my ticket stubs of places i would go photos that i was taking and i was just like i i love this idea of just kind of layering all that into my sketchbook and then drawing into it painting into it and a lot of those actually work their way into my thesis show because um i'm also a huge fan of like architecture i love architecture and i love um various i love like the history of architecture, different different types of of architecture throughout history. And that's one of the things that's fascinated me with, with, with Rome and Europe in general is that, well, like, let's just say like in Italy, like you could, you know, well, let's Rome in particular, like you could be next to a a building that was built in 2001. And then it's right next to a building that was built in the year one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so it's like, and then everything in between that, and so it's literally a collage, you know, I mean, it's like they're constantly, you know, unearthing, you know, Roman ruins and, and, uh, and, 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 and you go through throughout, you know, antiquity up into the Middle Ages and then the Renaissance and then the Baroque period and all these different periods. And it's all in one space, but it's all still there. And so you have this wonderful tapestry of, of, of so many different uh, styles and influences and customs and ideas and it's all just kind of mashed together. And so I love to kind of emulate that. And that's what my, my thesis work was in, in uh, when I was in grad school and, and I'm, and I'm still doing that today. Like that's what this book sort of is because it's a documentary. It's really, you know, I call it a graphic nonfiction, but it's really like this, you know, like so many, like you watch a documentary, like, I don't know, like Werner Herzog or some sort of a, um, you know, just, just any do- many documentaries, you know, you'll see a lot of sort of where they'll do vignettes of like newspapers and then, you know, various old photographs and different, you know, film footage and then B footage, B reels, and then, you know, all that kind of stuff kind of, and then they'll do maybe an animation and all that kind of stuff. And so, I'm kind of doing that uh, uh, in a two-dimensional format on on paper, you know, and so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I, um, so, yeah. Does that does that kind of <laughs> answer your question it, as far as my no, meaning? It does. Um, and something that I love that you said is. Um, whenever you have things that are super old or super new, it's the juxtaposition that creates this incredible tapestry. And Uh I think that when you have so many um, artistic influences, finding a way to mirror that creates a tapestry of your artistry. And so I love that you've been able to do that for your audience and for yourself and see that artistic come to light. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, yeah, I well, and I find collage is such a it's 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 such an immediate sort of medium to work in, as well as drawing. And so that's like I said, I love the immediacy of being able to just pick up a drawing utensil and being able to draw, as well as taking objects and found papers and photos and and ephemera. You know, just like that's why yeah. it was great while I'm traveling. I'll take you know, things that I collect along my travels and just stick them in my, I'll glue them into my sketchbooks because it's like, I, it's this, this, this time capsule, you know, and, but it's like this, it feels like this living thing because I keep, I can keep 
expanding on it and it keeps growing. And also, you know, when you take objects and place that into a, uh, you know, pl and plop it onto a canvas or into your paper or your sketchbook or whatever, you're taking something with a history, you know, so that history, you know, like really ignites your, your immediately. It's like your, uh, whatever your composition is immediately loaded with this, this backstory, you know, and it's just exciting because it's so immediate and it happens so fast. And it's, I love it when art moves, you know, when art's not just this stagnant thing, but this thing that, you know, can, can move. That's why I love film. And that's why I love, um, theater. I love all kinds of, I love all kinds of art. To be honest. <laughs> And just so the audience is clear, the book we're talking about um, oh. mostly here is the Crescent Hotel book, which is what follows is true Crescent Hotel. Correct. And which yes. is, um, if you go to SeanFitzgibbonArt.com, you can find that. Um, yeah, or just Sean Fitzgibbon. I have that URL as well, just SeanFitzgibbon.com or Sean Fitzgibbon Art, either one. I'll oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I you know, I loved how the mood of your uh, everything you described in your history has kind of come together in this mood of this book and Thank you. Yeah. i love that it has kind of this a little I, I, from someone who knows very little about this it comes across a little bit as like this um it's definitely more of a noir batman dark knight kind <laughs> of feel to sure. it but sure. the layering is is even prevalent on the cover like you could see how you've taken those different mediums and put them together and i yeah. love that about it it definitely creates an atmosphere that isn't necessarily found in many other places you yeah. definitely made that your own and i love that <laughs> that's funny you say that sort of batman <laughs> because it, well, i know what you mean because it's almost you know, I mean, as a kid, like I said, like when when I was in, back in high school, I used to read a lot of that stuff, and so it was like, you know, you can't see if any any or even any film version of that. It's like Gotham City. It's like there's no every room is lit with like one single light bulb that is is a low wattage light bulb, and 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 my work is always the same way. It's, it's like, don't you have any like light lamps in this world? It's like you just have one little light bulb that. that you know, like a 30 watt, 20 watt light bulb. And that's it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like a nightlight. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like a nightlight light in every room. And that's it. That's all we have. I kind of feel like you should, um, or my response in that moment would be, no, I want every panel to feel like um, Alfred Hitchcock is going to walk into the room and turn to the audience and say, <laughs> the following story you're about to witness <laughs> is both true and possible. <laughs> right. Good evening. Right. Good evening. <laughs> I even That's love, good. yeah. I even love how you put what follows is true. It's not how the typical, uh, based on a true story or anything like that. Oh, it's so cool. I love thank it. You. It's got a little I mystery. Actually, yeah. yeah, really Eric, neat. Yeah. Eric Larson actually liked that. Eric, the writer, uh, the nonfiction writer of. Devil in the White City. Are you familiar with Devil okay. in the White City? Okay, heard of it. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> in the Garden of Beasts. I'm trying to think. He's he's a nonfiction author. And anyway, no, I, he did Dead Wake and in the Garden of Beasts. Dead Wake. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he was at our local library. We have this amazing library where I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is where the University of Arkansas is, and. Uh, my wife's a librarian, actually, at the Fayetteville Public Library, and so, but he he can't. He was at one of our, you know, like David Grant, if you he, which he was here as well. I, I love. I read a lot of nonfiction books, you know, like that kind of read like novels, and that's what. But anyway, I, I got to meet him, and he was. I was telling him about my book at the time because it wasn't even available yet. But he was. He liked that. What follows is true. But my little banner, which, which, let me tell you, Emily, that's the beginning of, of the series. We can get into that later. So it's going to be this ongoing thing. What follows is true. This one's just Crescent Hotel. So, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about the Crescent Hotel. Okay. Yeah. How, well, so have either of you been to Eureka Springs? 
No. Yeah. Have you all? Okay. So, have you ever been to Arkansas? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I was there one time for like okay. six yeah. hours. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, were you like the border time? Okay. So, all right. Well, like, uh, so I'm from, like I said, where I'm from is like Southwest Missouri. And it's like a hundred miles from this, this very, this small uh, town in right in the middle of the Ozark region. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful town. So those are mountains. And uh, it's a town called Eureka Springs. And uh, my parents would take us on, you know, like during, you know, on, we'd take little road trips to the, to the, uh, take my sister and I, you know, to the, to Eureka Springs. And it's, like I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, and it's also extremely, very strange town. It's, it's a, it's a Victorian town, like almost all the homes are these lovely little Victorian cottages. But, but they're perched almost like precariously up on these like huge bluffs, like big limestone bluffs, which is that's the only reason they were able to even build this town like this because it's all up in these mountains is because it's on limestone, you know, because otherwise they would, these, these crazy, you know, these homes would just like slide down the side of the a hill, you know. Wow. Um, but, uh, and it's also wild because the front porches of these homes look like they're like a one-story victorian home but you go in and the it's like the other side is like three floors down you know and it's 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 it, or it's the opposite it looks like it's it's the whole town is built up on these like bluffs it's just so crazy and um there's stairs everywhere like the they call it the stair step town <laughs> and it was it was deemed one of the nine most unusual towns in the U.S. by Robert Ripley hmm. of Ripley, believe it or not. Yeah. And hmm. it, I mean, oh, there's no intersections in Eureka Springs. Like there, there, all the roads serpentine throughout. Um, there's no right angles, and there's no stoplights in the town. And 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 on top of that, part of there's a subterranean portion of the town that because they actually grew, they built the town up at one point. And so it's almost like there's this underground, like almost like catacombs. Like I've, I've been to like Europe, I've been to like Paris and Rome and different places and where they actually have catacombs. And it's like, it's kind of like a, a smaller version of that. <laughs> like, wow. like, it's, it's so bizarre. I mean, it is just so bizarre. And there's like, there's one hotel, it's called the Basin Park Hotel. It's an old historic hotel. And uh, it's seven floor, seven floors tall, but every floor is at ground level. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's because it's built up against this mountain. Okay. So every, every time you get out, like you, you step out on the balcony, you're at ground level. It's just so bizarre. It's like the whole town. It's like uh, the architecture and the geology and the geography, like the the like it all coalesced into this one. Once again, I kind of get back to this sort of collage, like t tapestry, like you know. It's also another crazy thing um, is the uh, it's the only town in the U.S. where the entire downtown is on the historic registry. There's no other town that can claim that. Wow. And 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 a reason for that is because it's like if you go there, you know, in most towns, it's like you, you look down a, a street and you see a picture of that same street from like 100 years ago or. 150 years ago and you're like yeah i can kind of make out i can kind of make out it. but the eureka springs it almost looks identical you know you're like oh yeah that's that's the street you know and it is really interesting um and as a little kid i was just always blown away by all this i mean the whole town feels like you're on a movie set like it, oh, it, wow. it, it really does like it does not seem real um i really want to go there now it feels like a dream. it's like a it's like an unusual little dream town and and I love going to places that like that like I, I anytime my wife and I travel anywhere we always have to go 
to places like that or we go to these yeah. all, out of the way like i'm a big like atlas obscura fan you know oh, yeah i love yeah, atlas obscura love atlas obscura you know I, I could probably i could pull off one of the books out of one of my shelves around here and be like oh yeah see like this but um no i love it and uh but and so um and like I said, there's stairs that just lead all the way up these, 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 these throughout the town everywhere. Like I said, they call it the stair step town. And I, I don't remember like how many, but there's stairs and trails and they just go everywhere. And uh, anyway, at the highest point of this town sits this enormous old Gothic sort of quasi Gothic Victorian hotel that looks like it's right out of a, you know, a Stephen King novel and it's uh, the Crescent Hotel. And, and uh, this, this hotel was built back in 1886 and it was this luxury resort uh, hotel. And like, we would go on, on to this hotel, you know, when we'd visit and they have these ghost tours. Okay. Now this would have been back in the eighties. And at that time, like they didn't really know a whole lot about some of the history during like, um, but it, but I got a gist of sort of the history, like, um, you know, it started out this resort hotel, um, 1886, same year the Statue of Liberty was erected at one time they had a miniature Statue of Liberty out there. Ah. So, um, but anyway, uh, and it was, uh, it was built by, st- uh, Irish stonemasons that they hired that quarried limestone from the nearby white river. And, and, uh, and in fact, this hotel, it's like, it's, a, it's, you know, built in 1886, but there's no mortar. That's it's like these massive limestone blocks and it's all just weight that holds this thing up. It's crazy, but it looks like almost like a giant cat, like fortress or something, or uh, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, it's beautiful, but it's, it's really interesting. And, uh, so after, but you know, it was, like I said, it was an exclusive resort where only the luminaries and the most wealthy people could come visit. And, uh, but it kind of falls on hard times because you also got to remember this is in the middle of the Ozark region. And it's like the, the roads to get there are just crazy. Imagine what it was like, like it's hard to get there now <laughs> almost, you know, going in the winter now, you know, but it's like, it's, curvy roads everywhere but imagine back in 18 the 18 late 1800s you know right uh and so they always had it had a hard time keeping it open you know financial they had a financial difficulties and so in the early 1900s like 1906 around that time it, it uh becomes a uh, in order to supplement their lagging winter hours it turns into this the crescent uh, girls school it's like it's this conservatory for girl for girls hmm. and and it's and it was actually a very very progressive this wonderful school you know it was, it was a really nice school and uh and it remained this and, and so in the summer it would become the crescent hotel and resort um and uh so anyway it, it both the crescent and the girls school lasted until um for quite for you know a couple decades until um the great depression kind of kills off both of them in the early 19 in the early 30s and uh and that's whenever it just it sits dormant for a couple of years until this guy comes wheeling into town driving this purple cord roadster this is 1937 wearing these white suits purple shirts and lavender ties. Wow. And he's got the cure for cancer. He's like, I've got the cure for cancer and I can pull you guys out of, cause this is the great depression. And he's like, I, I can pull you all out of the great depression because I, I can turn this, this derelict hotel into a cancer hospital. And, and so it becomes the, the Baker hospital and it remained the Baker hospital from 1936 to 1939, up until Norman Baker's arrest. <laughs> so, for, uh, for uh, fraud, is that what? For, well, yeah. Oh, for oh, for sure. I and mean, that's what this whole thing. <laughs> and, and well, and I mean, that is the very, very like the dark, dark chapter of that hotel's history. 
um, because many people died there. He was a charlatan. He was a quack, and it was like and and he was taking advantage of sick and dying people. And so and and so the hotel is notorious for being this haunted location. Like you know, they people go there for those tours. And uh, in fact, I think it was like in the early two thousands, one of the ghost you know those ghost shows like the Taps. Uh, Oh, yeah. I can't think what, but they they were there and they and saw apparently they kind of saw this like kind of full apparition and that it was from that it really just started gaining more and more notoriety and so um, and anyway as a kid like I was always just kind of fascinated by by this stuff but this is back in the eighties and so they would just kind of tell you little bits of and pieces about when it was this Baker Hospital because they didn't really know all that much. Um, and some of the things they told were just really kind of ghoulish and creepy. And, and I mean, as a kid reading, you know, I, I, I was like, I, I kind of grew up reading a lot of like, you know, I, I've always loved Gothic sort of literature, like Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. And like I said, I'd watch stuff like The Haunting with my my mom, you know, and we, we watch that kind of stuff like Hitchcock, you know. Yeah. Norman Baker, Norman Bates sounds kind of, you know, mm-hmm, it does. <laughs> You know, very, there's a lot of similarities there. And so um, anyway, and okay, now this is very strange. So in around the time I finished this book, okay, the, there was a landscaper doing, doing, land, doing some landscaping outside the Crescent Hotel. They're going to put in like an archery course. Woman's in the, you know, digging. This woman's out there. She's in this backhoe. Shovel goes down and she scoops up earth you know outside the crescent all of a sudden all these jars come tumbling out she comes she gets closer and you know inspects there is what appears to be human remains inside these jars and so yes i'm not i'm not even kidding so anyway it well it it's so this place this this section of you know what she dug up is is roped off as a crime scene and these jars are taken to state crime labs for analysis. Okay. Anyway, they determined that it was it, re- it dated back to the late 1930s when Norman Baker was the proprietor when it was the Baker Hospital. But they kept digging, so it became more of like an archaeological site. And so the University of Arkansas was out there, like their archaeological survey, doing research, and they found thousands of these jars. And and what it was was like cancerous tissue that was extracted from deceased patients. And, and ba- but Baker was actually using this as like part of his promotional material. Like it is so bizarre. And I actually interviewed, one of the people that I interviewed was this older gentleman um, who was a kid during ni- the, the 1940s. Like in the, and so like in, after Baker was arrested in 1939, the uh, the the hotel is once again sets empty throughout World War II. This this guy, like I said, when he was a kid, he and his friend sneak into the Crescent. <laughs> this is, I mean, talk about creepy. If you can imagine sneaking into this hotel slash hospital, and there's wheelchairs everywhere, and they go down into what the basement area where the where the uh, morgue was, you know, and they find just all these jars, they find that the same sets of jars that were then buried and unearthed uh, 80, 90 years later on the uh, grounds of the Crescent Hotel. And it's crazy because whenever I heard about this, that that garnished national attention. And and I actually knew all about what it was. They were like, we don't know what these jars are. And I'm like, well, I know exactly what it was. And so it was kind of wild at one, for, you know, for one time in my life, I'm kind of in the death. <laughs> you know, just because I've worked on this this book about this strange bit of history at this very interesting and unusual place, you know. But, wow. Yeah, I don't even remember what was the <laughs> what was the question. It was, uh, what, oh, I mean, you were just telling us about the Crescent Hotel. Oh, about, the, about the hotel, well, right? And, about the hotel and about your, you know. Yeah, yeah, and well, and it's a book, and and it's a uh, you know, it, and then once it, after you know, it sat dormant after he was arrested, it becomes this hotel again, um, and so 
I, you know, I moved to Fayetteville back in 03 for graduate school. And during that time, I was still like, like I said, as a kid, you know, I was just fascinated by that story. And so um, while I was going to grad school, I would take trips down to Eureka Springs and stay at the hotel. And I would just kind of go on the ghost tours. And they were still sort of kind of had this sensational feel to them. And so they've gotten much better and much more historic nowadays. But at that time, I was, you know, I was, I, you know, I really didn't wanted to know what the what the whole story was, and so uh, I uh, just started doing research, you know, and that was over a decade ago, and I just and I and uh, did re, I yeah, I, I did extensive research for quite a few years uh, on that and on that particular those two years of when it was this hospital, because when Norman Baker was arrested. Uh, he was he was ultimately arrested for mail fraud because he was sending out these pamphlets all over the country that you know that he like, cured cancer you know <laughs> which he did not um, obviously yeah right yeah his his cancer cure consisted of uh, carbolic acid glycerin corn silk spring water and crushed up watermelon seeds. Uh, but his true, his true formula was, uh, oh, and then they would inject that into the, into the patients. But his true formula was demagogue, de demagoguery and populist rhetoric because he, um, they, you know, Baker started out a, uh, he was a high school dropout and then he becomes a machinist. His father was a machinist. His mother was a writer, but he he uh, works for his father for a bit as a machinist, and then he he has a contentious relationship with him, and a, so he has a falling out with him. And he works for this. This is in Muscatine, Iowa, on the Mississippi, kind of not too far from my like Hannibal, Missouri, where Mark Twain's from. Oh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, he's uh, um, another guy that wore white suits, right? And, uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> I mean, it the, is the South. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. There you go. Um, so anyway, uh, anyway, he he works some more machinist jobs, you know, and, and uh, he keeps having these falling out. He has he has argue, he is like falling outs with everybody he basically meets, and then he becomes this like a vaudeville magician. He's he's a uh, a mentalist. He becomes a mentalist. I don't know if any of you ever saw, uh, there was a movie recently. Oh, Tilda Swinson, I believe was in it. <laughs> we were talking about oh, yeah? Tilda Swinson. Uh, Bradley Cooper, it's called uh, Nightmare Alley. It was oh, directed yeah. by Guillermo del Toro. And that Bradley Cooper plays a, a mentalist. It's a great movie. Um, and that's kind of like what Norman Baker was. And uh, which was sort of like, a con artist he was a con artist you know and anyway um he was he was not only a con artist but he was also brilliant and he becomes this sort of populist radio show host later and and uh he's always getting in trouble with the fcc with the federal like the federal communication uh federal radio com communications the mm -hmm. frc F, uh, yeah and uh because he's always amping his wattage up way too. Oh. At one point, you know, he could hear his his radio station clear out in like Honolulu from Muscatine, wow. Iowa, and they're like all over the place. And uh, so he was always in trouble with them. And then at one point, but he was also this entrepreneur. Like he was, he was, uh, he had a uh, a uh, uh, his radio station, but he also had a. Uh, like a mail order catalog like it was like a general merchandise kind of like a sears and robot type catalog where you could just buy anything like car tires all the way to cans of beans you know and upholstery for yeah just anything you know like a sears and robot catalog and uh if he just kind of stuck with that and his entertain he, he had like bands and stuff that would come on his radio station but he also had this ten tendency to get into, he was always against the American Medical Association, um, constantly at odds with doctors and, and uh, 
the establishment. And, and in fact, at one point, he was always kind of uh, appealing more to like farmers. And, and uh, one time he was, uh, he was telling like in one of his, uh, uh, one of his radio programs, he's telling the farmers of Iowa, he's like, this is during uh, tuberculosis is a big thing. And so people are needing to get their farmers need to get their cows tested for tuberculosis, you know, from bovine TB. And so Norman Baker is basically telling these farmers on the air, don't let, don't let these veterinarians and scientists get near, you know, come to your farm and take, you know, uh, test your cattle because what they're going to do is give you a false positive and take away your healthy cattle, you know, and, and he's telling them he's basically this anti-vaxxer and he was an anti-vaxxer anti-science so anyway he's telling all these farmers this and you know what these farmers end up doing they end up rising up and they go to the state capitol and violently protest in iowa and it, and it becomes so bad that they had to call in the state militia to stop to stop it to break it up and wow. so yeah i know and this is in the 1920 i know it sounds kind of familiar, <laughs> familiar does it a little bit i don't know but um yeah, very, very crazy. And so anyway, Baker then, you know, because he's so anti this and that and establishment, he finds out about this, uh, this guy in St. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri. He claims to be this doctor named Charles Ozias, who claims to have the cure for cancer. And Baker's like, well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and he, and he, uh, he uh, finds out his cancer cure and then has him on the show, finds out the cancer cure, and then Baker's like, I have the cure for cancer. And so he basically takes this guy's fake cancer cure, and then on his show and on his mag in his magazine, TNT, TNT is an acronym for The Naked Truth, and his radio stations, KTNT, know The Naked Truth. He says, I'm going to have five test patients in a, with advanced forms of cancer on my show and they're going to take my these treatments he calls it a storm like number five and and uh and th they're going to be cured on my show because he puts in his magazine and on his radio station that well, i have the cure for cancer so this is around new year's of this year like in the 19 mid 20s and so by spring of that same year all five of his test patients had died oh and then what does he do? He rep he reprints the same thing, the same magazine article, not just once and not twice, but three different times without changing a single word. And and he and he also repeats that on his radio station as well, even though the people died like just right after that. And so and then right after that, he starts the Baker Hospital. Oh my gosh! So, right, he started, but that was in Muscatine, Iowa. And so he finally ends up getting kicked out of out of Iowa. He goes down to Mexico and he starts up another hospital down there so he can do this on the Mexican border. And he also has his radio station where he can spout out all his demagoguery and fake cancer cures and 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 rail against the American Medical Association without because he's on the border. And so they can't, you know, and, and he can also he doesn't have to uh, follow the FCC guidelines. Right. And uh, so he does that for for quite a few years until he finally gets bored with that, and he ends up he ends up going back to to the states. He goes to Muscatine. Some for some bizarre reason, he only ends up serving a day in jail, and and it's and and then he goes down to uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and uh, and that's when he turns you know he uh finds out about the crescent hotel and he learns about now see eureka springs originally people came to eureka springs because of the the spring water you know uh there's all these beautiful springs there, and they and they supposedly had these sort of curative properties you know and so baker is very smart he's like ah okay i'm going to kind of capitalize on that and uh and so that's that's what he does. And so that's what part of his cancer cure is, like I said, carbolic acid, uh, glycerin, water, crushed up watermelon seeds, corn syrup, and 
Eureka spring spring water. Right. So it's like, so he's got it, you know, and then, and, and, uh, and then it's like, it all kind of goes downhill until, yeah, until he finally is arrested and many people, you know, died there. And, and it's a very, it's very sad, it's a very tragic story, but it's yeah. also, it, it, and it's where all these sort of ghost stories come from. And I, you know, it's just the, his, his story and the Crescent Hotel story are both so strange and so unique and they're so they're these these there's so many different chapters you know and it's just so interesting that i just thought it would make for such a great book and you know a great, and not only a book but like you know the, this is my the graphic nonfiction, you know and so this this whole entire book is painted you know it's like that's really nice it. yeah thank you it's like it's all painted this is watercolor and so it's like and then some of that mixed media i was telling you all about but uh um and it and it's nonfiction. i mean it's all oral histories uh, it's uh it's all from from news old newspaper articles old uh letters correspondence in fact in my book anytime anyone's even speaking if it's historical like if it's norman baker or anyone else like it's it's from actual correspondence that I that I found. So yeah, they're wow. actually I'm actually using their words. That's so. cool. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I <laughs> number one, my mind is completely blown that this yeah. happened in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, <laughs> and for you to take all of that and to put it into such an incredible piece of work, um, can you can you talk about the process? Um, like it, you mentioned that it took you about ten years, um, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm interested how you took all of that and how you formulated that into a, a story and kind of how you started to section your book off. Can you talk a little bit about how you put your book together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I uh, so like I said, I uh, early on, you know, I'm and I'm. It, it really just kind of grew into like I was doing a little bit of research, you know, like lo uh, in Eureka Springs at the library, and uh, the next thing you know, it, it grows. I'm 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 uh, I live in the you know uh, Fayetteville University town, it's where the University of Arkansas is. So I would spend a lot of time at their library doing research, and then the next thing you know, I'm in Muscatine, Iowa, where Baker's from, doing a bunch of research up there. And so I'm just compiling all this research and I'm thinking that, that you know, I'm, 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 I've had this idea of like, I'm, I'm also just a rabid documentary film fan. I love film. I love documentary film. I love this idea of, like I said, layering and telling stories with, uh, with, with, uh, you know, like I said, oral histories and correspondence and old newspapers. In fact, I'll layer old newspapers. Um, well, let me get to that here in a minute. I'll, I, uh, so I start compiling all this information and I, so I've got like two milk crates. Okay. Like full of, of literally of like just microfiche, like that I, uh, photocopy, you know, just photocopies, old magazines, like Baker's, Ma like all these, like just correspondence, letters, notes, and, and, uh, books that I found. And, and I literally, it's like two of these milk crates, you know, and they're like, and then, like I said, my, my wife, um, at the time she was my fiance, we got married back in like, Oh, eight. um, I, but I was in grad school, we were dating and, uh, and, but she's a librarian. And so she was very instrumental in helping me out with organizing all this, you know, cause I had all this information and I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. I wanted to tell sure. this visually. I want to tell the story visually. And so she was instrumental in helping me sort of chronologically kind of lay break all this stuff out, you know, into different, into different categories kind of in, and not only chronologically, but also in uh, kind of labeling it like Norman Baker has so many different, well, both the Crescent hotel, like I had one, one section, it was all the Crescent hotels history chronologically laid out as well as Norman Baker's his, history laid out chronologically. So then I have all this material and I, and so I'm sitting there just racking my brain on like, okay, now I need to have, I need to tell the story, but how do I do that? Like, I don't even know, how do you do something like that? Right. And, uh, 
Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm doing my research and I find out that, you know, uh, during the time Baker was there, there was the, the mayor of Eureka Springs was a guy named uh, Claude Fuller. And I've interviewed his, his grandson, a guy named John Cross, who owns the, the, the prominent bank in Eureka Springs. And he's also a, somewhat of an historian himself. And, and uh, anyway, Claude Fuller, his grandfather was um, was also an Arkansas. He was a U.S. congressman from Arkansas, so he was he spent his time in both Eureka Springs and Washington D.C. and he was doing both. You know, he was doing all that while Baker was there, and and Claude Fuller was very instrumental in helping Eureka Springs become this tourist destination that it is today, and this beautiful Victorian uh, village, like I told you about. And, uh, and, and, uh, anyway, um, while he was there or well, okay. Before Baker moved into town, Fuller was one of the owners of the hotel. And so he knew it very well. And, and, uh, by the time Baker comes into town, he completely turns the whole, he paints the hotel, like the interior paint, uh, purple. And he puts up this art, this, he, he takes, he just ruins the Victorian decor and puts up oh. this like, art deco, horrible, like triangular patterns all over the place. He paints it purple. It looks like a circus. Like if you look at my book, you can see he rips out the, the beautiful balustrades in front of the hotel. Like, and he puts in these concrete, porches and forever destroying the, I mean, it's still a beautiful hotel, but he completely destroys the original, you know, look of this place. And, uh, did you tour it yourself? Like you, you went in and got to look oh, at, Oh, it's still a hotel. You can, everybody, you can go. I've been there many times. I mean, okay. But, oh yeah. It's, you can go there. Yeah. I mean, it's a hotel. You can stay there at the Crescent. Um, but what I was getting at is, so it's like, so Fuller comes, you know, comes, he's, he is somebody that I was able to sort of project out as being like us, like a, a normal sort of person who's kind of seeing what, you know, what's happening to this place. And so he's also, his brother, uh, Harvey Fuller was the, was the postmaster at the time. And if you remember, like I said, they were able to get him, you know, like on mail fraud because right. they worked with local law enforcement or the, with with the anyway and so uh and uh anyway the, uh so i once i had someone that was able to sort of because fuller was kind of instrumental he and his brother in bringing norma baker down and so once i had someone that we could sort of assimilate into and see it through someone else's eyes then i was able to start kind of putting the narrative together and uh I also, so then I'm able to start kind of like, you know, and, and it's also a lot of like my journey, like um, as a, as doing this documentary, you know? And so I, I draw myself sort of in this, this in like my interest in the Crescent Hotel and, and why I'm so interested. And uh, so the, the book tends to go back and forth from like the, well, I say the present, but like, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, you know, but the 2000s. And then we go back to like, you know, Norman Baker's time at the Crescent. And then we go back to the early, uh, you know, or late 1800s when it was built and when Norman Baker was a kid and all that. And we're kind of, vis re you know, going, you know, we kind of do these circles around. And we also, like I, like I told you, I, I interviewed that guy who goes through the hotel as a kid when it was dilapidated or it was, it was abandoned. It was just this derelict hotel. And uh, so I've kind of got, and the book is color coded. Like it's like the, the, the period in which Baker's there, there it has this overall sort of purple tonality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then in the present or the two thousands, it's like, has, I complement that with more of a green tone. And then we go back further in, in the past, the 1900s, it's more of sepia tones. I see and, that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and 
So, you know, I'm just, I'm, I basically kind of script out this, I just lay this whole thing out. Like I'm scripting it as far as like my journey, visiting the hotel, going on the ghost tour. And I, and I put all this in the, in the book, like as a kid and why my interest I'm going on the ghost tour and I tell the legends and all that. And then I go back to when Baker was there and I tell his story and oh, and at the beginning, it's those children going through the hotel yeah. during the late forties. And so you see the hotel during all these different stages of history, you know, and it's really neat. It's a book that really lends itself to multiple reads because I want it to be kind of this immersive experiment experience because place is very important to me. And you get to see all these different rooms and places in different periods and different times and in different conditions, you know, and, and, uh, going through these transformations, you know, these bizarre transformations. And, uh, and, and so I, I, as a, as, like I said, I think being, you know, a graphic, not, well, it's not a graphic novel, it's a graphic nonfiction, but that's the, the medium that I think works best for telling such a story, you know, because, uh, I'm able to just kind of, you know, do that. And I, and I, and I basically, I, almost all of it is oral histories, like I said, correspondence. And I'm just kind of like uh, collaging all that throughout in this narrative. Like, like I said, in a, in a cohesive uh, chronological narrative, you know, and uh, it, it's a lot of work, but, I made it work, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then once I, well, once I had that all figured out, then I was able to start, I basically did like these to answer your question, Trey, I would do these little like thumbnails, almost like storyboards, you know, like you see for a film, you know, like a, these little, and I had a whole, I have a whole book somewhere around here. It's like, of just these small, uh, they look like little storyboards. They're just little storyboards in a, in a, and I'm laying out the way it's going to be, you know, the the layout and composition for each of the pages. And and then I'm just figuring out, you know, which from interviews, you know, I'm basically different people. Like you watch a documentary and you'll see different scenes when people are talking and it's kind of overlaid over like whether it be like a reenactment or, you know, some sort of a just still shot of different places or whatever. And I'm kind of doing that like in this book as well, you know, I'm just kind of putting their, their different, you know, all these different people's, uh, you know, their, their, their thoughts and their, their words from their, my interviews with them. So I, I'm in the book, but I'm never really, I'm not, I'm just sitting there asking, and, and they're telling me something. I'm not really saying anything. I'm more of like a, a vessel that the, the viewer can then sort of assimilate into, you know? Yeah. It, for me, it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, for me as like a reader or for me as uh, the person ingesting this information, that yeah. I like that kind of storytelling. Uh, it reminds me a lot of um, American Horror Story where you start to pick up like little bits of pieces of things as they start to do like mini flashbacks and you don't get the whole flashback you just get like a little segment and then a couple episodes later you get a love another con uh, connected segment to that and you start to put everything together yes and i think that is a really creative way of doing that yes um and it sounds like you've done that very effectively thank you yes yes I, um, I, I love that as well. I, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of, of, and also just trying to take all these working parts and make it as cohesive as possible. But also, like you said, just giving little pieces, little breadcrumbs along the way, you know, so you don't, you know, you just want to keep, because, I mean, it's one of those stories that, like the, the hotel itself is always sort of giving these little, little mysteries it presents to the public like just a few years ago those jars were unearthed you know and that's like what another crazy trap chapter in this hotel's very assorted history you know and uh and I, my book is very much like that just like what you were saying you know and, but i think that's wonderful that's it's it's the questions that i think when something 
is elevated into the realm of art because we as the reader are still kind of wrestling with it and trying to understand and figure out what it is. But if it's just wrapped up in a nice little bow and it's like everything's presented to us and we, you know, then it's just kind of like, well, it's, it's like eating a happy meal at McDonald's. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like you watched a Marvel movie and it's like, okay. And then you just, it's like, Oh, I had that big Mac and that's it. You know what I mean? It's like, you it, yeah. it's 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 I, I it, that's why we still go back to like you know a movie like citizen kane or you know 2001 a space odyssey these movies that we keep these things or, or the great works of art that we keep going back to and kind of where it asks more questions than it gives answers you know and it's like you know uh, and that's where like longer forms of medium I, I think that's where Marvel personally excels in that, in those longer sure. forms of medium. Right, um, right. They don't get everything right up at the start. Right. And right. when you kind of delay those things or you start hinting at certain things through little right. episodes, little right. Easter eggs, um, right. that really captures the audience's attention. Right, right, for sure, yeah. And, um, yeah. For, um, for my sake, um, like I, I, <laughs> I opened the cover and I just looked at that and I had to stare at it for a solid like five, six minutes just at the cover to like see what details that I could pick out. Was there a window that was like illuminated that, um, <laughs> was there a figure in the window? What was the text saying behind, um, behind the, uh, the hotel itself yeah. to see if I could maybe find a clue? <laughs> <laughs> That, Good, yes. that was I one thing that. I wanted to ask too and I know this is deviating a little bit but you, when you talked about layering where you took actual clips of letters and things like uh -huh. that how do you yeah. like that seems to be something that like I don't know how to do that myself I can maybe pick up a colored pencil and sketch something but when mm -hmm. it comes to like layering those things um, can you I don't want you to give away any of your proprietary you know yeah, info but like how yeah. do you how do you go about that okay yeah like so like there's the uh page like when when i, I talk about when the hotel was first uh built mm -hmm. um and i there's a gentleman by the name of pal clayton um and he was he was sort of instrumental and he was he was another fayetteville or not Fay eureka springs luminary who helped, you know, get Eureka Springs on the map. And, uh, he, uh, and I draw, I draw him in the corner, but then I have a big drawing of the Crescent Hotel, but in the background behind him is the, uh, an old newspaper of when the hotel was first opened in, in 1886. Yeah. And I, I took a, I, I, I made a copy, a photocopy of that, of, of that. And I did what's called a solvent transfer onto watercolor paper it's okay. so crazy so i take i take uh you take like a uh it's almost like a turpentine solution and you uh you i i take the photocopy and i put it on the watercolor of this old of this newspaper i i i i have to copy it in reverse i flip it in photoshop i flip okay, it well, and this is stuff that i could but just do in photoshop he, he can, but i want it to be on an actual like these are actual pages on watercolor paper. And so I wanted to be as hand drawn as possible. Like they're in galleries. Like right now they're in it. I have some in a gallery in uh, Bentonville. It's at 21 C it's a museum hotel in 21 C in Bentonville. And also I have some in Oklahoma city and I have some, I'm going to have some in university of Arkansas, Monticello in the fall. I, I've got all these shows lined up, but I, with the original pages from this book, so anyway, I do the, I, I flip it. So it's backwards, the, the text and everything. And then I, uh, you brush this solvent. It's called image eradicator. No, it's, I can't think of what it's called right now, but it's like a turp, it's like image eradicator or something like that. It's this turpentine solution. And you just, uh, you brush it on the back of the paper. And then I take like a spoon and burnish it really hard, like against, you know, and, and you rub it and, mm -hmm. Then you you pull the 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 uh, paper back, you know your photocopy, and it it transfers it onto the onto the paper, you know. And so I've got this transfer, and and it's not perfect, but I kind of like that. I want it to be sort of ghosted in the yeah. background, 
So then I do the then I do the drawing like of Pal Clayton, this historic figure, and then the Crescent Hotel, this drawing and painting on top of that. And so and that's what that is. And I do that throughout the book because um like I said, I love that sort of layering of, you know, um throughout. And I also love symbolism. I love like I'm a big fan of, like I said, a lot of art history. In fact, I teach an art history course in the summer on the college level. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of like, I'm always looking at like a lot of like early Renaissance and uh, Northern Renaissance because they use a lot of symbolism throughout their work. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so I'm, 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 I love kind of incorporating Things like that, where the where you know it, it it works as this narrative. Like you can just kind of read it on many different levels. Like you can just kind of read through it, and it's just going to make perfect sense. But you can also read it on you know on, on a different level where there's a lot of little little Easter eggs and symbols that if you can kind of pick up on, it's like oh I, that's pretty neat. You know I love that kind of right. thing. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I noticed it looks kind of watercolory, and I wondered how how that was possible or if you actually sat and hand drew like the like the crescent hotel opens today article like if you actually well, managed to duplicate that font by hand somehow but right well, I that see was, now. So that, right that's what that was okay so, yeah, cool here, yeah here let me really quick right behind me actually here let me show you Here's here's a page from my book. This there's tape on this right now because it's taped off, but it's oh, yeah. like um oh. yeah. Um so can you describe what that oh. page is for us? Oh yeah, this is so uh this is in the book there's actually kind of crackling like lightning around her because this is uh and I did that I did do that, like I will uh then go back in if I have to and do a little bit of digital um, lighting effects and things like that. Okay. Um, and uh, anyway, this is whenever Baker was basically a, uh, this is kind of going into his history. And so when he was like a, on the vaudeville magician sort of circuit, okay. and he, he, he worked with a woman he called Madame Tangley and uh, her name was Teresa Pender. And she was his assistant and he would do all this, his, his, his magician acts, his, his, his mentalist acts. And she worked as his, his assistant and she was his wife briefly. Like they married for just a, a brief time. Um, and, uh, but anyway, yeah, all these, these are all actual pages. Like these are, um, yeah, the book's uh, fully drawn. Um, yeah, I can, I can hear it one second. I can show you. I, I was actually on this documentary yesterday and I was showing, uh, you can see like, this is like a drawn, these are the pencils of like, okay. People walking through the hotel, you know, like some pencil sketches, pencil draw. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, uh, um, well, somewhere I have, like, you can kind of see the. Well, I don't know. I've got, I kind of see different. <laughs> oh, you yeah. Kind of see, like, yeah, you kind of see it grow, you know, and then, like, you can kind of see the whole evolution of, like, color, you know, introducing color sure. into these pages. And, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, but that's all. Uh, it's all it's all watercolor you know this is what i just showed you but there you can okay. see more of it yeah wow. and uh it, it's a it's a lot a lot big 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 process you know? yeah that is quite an undertaking <laughs> i understand how it took you so long now that is uh, incredible and what a cool thing i mean there's something i always have in the back of my mind when i when i take in art in my brain i because everybody has everybody's lives and everybody's art is um we're limited by the amount of time we have on earth 
to create. Sure. And so the fact yeah. that it took you 10 years and the fact that it took you all of this time and effort to put this together, this is really, a, this is huge. This is 10 years of your life right here in this book. Yeah. And so yeah. when you think about how many other things we have to put 10 years into, like this is a huge part of you. So, yeah. and yeah. That you could tell because it really shows in the in the end result how the, you've yeah. you've put that into it. And I think that's something that as um, people who uh, take in art, I don't, I don't know how else to say that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people, as people who take in art, I encourage people to think about it that way. Because, yeah. you know, someone's little sketch to you, we're in a we're in a world right now where art is it's it's quickly thrown in our faces it's very fleeting and there's a oh. lot of everybody's got like a content creator and right. when it comes to art i don't think a lot of people realize how much time actually is not on screen that you don't see and right. and that you don't get to witness all of the hours of practice and um and uh research yeah. and things like that and so I encourage everybody to think about the 10 years of work that went into the success you see now. Right. And uh, right. so this is clearly something that is, um, I, I love that this immortalizes you in a very cool way. <laughs> oh, thank you. And uh, yeah. And I, so for our listening audience, what follows is true. Crescent Hotel is the book. And you should definitely go check that out. And you get a little sample of it on Sean Fitzgibbon, uh, art com, so that you can kind of see a little bit of like what we've been talking about today as well. The, um, yeah. And, yeah. and as far as like uh, what you have going on now, obviously you're promoting your book. What else are you working on? Um, you, you said a documentary yesterday, but. Oh no no no! Well, so yeah, the the uh, the documentary was uh, I was that's a, a separate thing. There's a some filmmakers uh, they're called it's called uh, Mad Owl Films, and they're doing a, a documentary on the Crescent. They just reached out to me um, about the it's about the Crescent Hotel, and and uh, they just interviewed me for this thing. And they're one of the guys is out of Lincoln, Nebraska, and the other was is out of. Uh, Austin, Texas, and they had a film crew and they, and they met with me yesterday and it was like, it's a, uh, yeah. And I was, just, I mean, I've been doing a lot of stuff like that. It was just, it was an interview basically. Cool. And, uh, yeah. So, and this is a thing that is supposed to be coming out, you know, later this year, like maybe in October and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with that. I, um, um, but yeah, just been, you know, kind of out promoting the book and it's like, this is a self-generated project. And so, I mean, I'm doing the whole, doing everything myself, you know, and so I'm going to a lot of b book events and things like that. Just trying to kind of promote the book, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, I mean, this is, uh, this is the beginning of a, uh, this is the beginning of a, uh, of a, of a series of, of books under that banner of what follows is true. And I'm actually working on the next one now. I'm 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 started on that not too long ago, and so cool. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's and it's not going to take another 15 years because <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figured out, you know, like how to sort of do this. I'm actually working on this next one along with someone, and so it's like it's it's to kind of speed things along. And so I'm gonna, you know, um, and it, there it's really just about. You know, like I said, I'm 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 a big like Atlas Obscura fan. I love t places. I love that sense of place, and I'm just kind of exploring unusual places that have these very un interesting, strange histories. And so often, you know, what you find out about these histories relate so. You know, they're so relevant to to our world today. You know, just like what mm -hmm. I found out about the Crest Motel and this charlatan, you know, that comes into, you know, comes into the town taking advantage of people. And, uh, and we see that, you know, and so that's what I found when I, when I, when I do these sort of, you know, when I explore these different places, you find out so much, you know, about the different, cause it's always about places and the people that occupied these places. And so, um, 
Yeah, it's it's a very, very interesting. And it's not just relegated to this area. It's like all over. Like I said, I love to travel. And so. Um, yeah. With <laughs> with that, and we really look forward to seeing more from uh, this continued series. Yeah. And I really think that your titles are going to really bring in more audiences. Um, for those that get inspired or are considering becoming visual storytellers of whatever medium, um, whether it be watercolor or with some other type of painting or um, some other type of artistry, what advice would you have for beginners? Um, well, I've learned that... that um, are you asking more about just the broad, like, how to get started like in publishing or getting your work printed or just about well we have an audience that has a lot of artists who maybe just want to they're thinking about diving into this type okay. of art yeah um, i got you or maybe exploring it a little bit do you have any advice yeah. for somebody who wants to dive in yes okay um i yeah i absolutely do i'm an art also an art educator like i said i'm gonna i'm an adjunct art instructor and I am um, on the college level, but I teach art classes. Like and I've taught kids, you know, all the way, all, I mean, I've taught people all the way from like, you know, kindergartners up to, you know, um, seniors, you know, I've taught the, the gamut of all cool. kinds of yeah. workshops. Oh yeah. And I, and I still do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I teach, you know, like the community creative center in town, just different venues. Um, in fact, I'm going to be doing one in Eureka Springs, we're still trying to figure that out, but it's going to be a graphic. It's about creating your own graphic nonfiction, kind of like what I'm doing. And that's going to be a workshop there at the writer's colony at Derry hollow in Eureka Springs. But I don't, okay. I don't know exactly check out, you know, get on my newsletter or check out my website or my social media and that, find out about that. But yeah, I think that, you know, taking some drawing classes, um, just learning to draw, because if you can learn how to draw, then you can visually communicate, you know, you can tell a story. And also I always, I recommend that, you know, people just read, read both fiction and nonfiction, you know, read a lot, draw a lot and just practice telling stories visually, you know? Um, but I, I, I recommend going back and forth between both, you know, fiction and nonfiction because, you know, there's truths in nonfiction or no in fiction, you know, even though there may be, you know, like, uh, so that really good fiction, there's truths in fiction. So, uh, even though it may not be true, there are truths, you know? Yep. And so, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, I just think, and then that's one of the things like with this book that, or, you know, I, I really do want to help bridge that gap and, and help, you know, I think the graphic novels are a great way to help promote literacy, you know, for, you know, because this book, I, I think that it's good for, you know, like teens on up to, you know, and just on up, you know, and uh, and and uh, it, it's it's a great way to sort of bridge that gap for some people that may not want to just read novels, you know, but it's a great way to sort of a, a gateway in a way, you know. And it also helps build visual literacy, you know, because there's a lot of people that don't really know how to even read graphic novels or um, like they don't understand how to navigate through the panels on a page. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, well, I and I but I intentionally make mine as simple as you as can be. You know, I, it's always like a basic um like a six panel configuration, boom, 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 boom. Or, you know, or it's just one big panel and two panels, you know, it's always easy to read. I don't have like little panels, big, pan you know, I don't have like panels all over the place or do anything too crazy, you know? It's got good uh, flow to it for sure. Yeah. And I want yeah. it to be just like, if anybody can read like Calvin and Hobbes or peanuts or, you know, any, syndicated strip then you could read this you know what right. i mean and so and that's pretty much anybody can you know um and you know the okay. other cool thing about this is it bridges the gap of language anybody right. in any yeah. country can look at this and understand the story absolutely absolutely art is powerful it's so visual visuals are so powerful 
you know, and uh, yeah, I adore that. I adore that you just said that. That's 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 fantastic. And, and yeah, just like I said, just answering that earlier question. I mean, just learn to you know draw the world around you. I'm always telling my students to to get out and draw people, draw you know, because that's um, we you know it's it's about people, you know, <laughs> and so. Right. And, and places and uh, in fact we have a we have a uh, museum uh, it's actually a believe it or not a world renowned museum here in, in uh, Northwest Arkansas it's called Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and uh, my cl- my college classes we're going to be meeting there this week to draw from you know masterworks and uh, and that's another great way to to just build your vo- visual vocabulary. And have mm-hmm. more of an understanding, because you know, of, of of art in general. And I think it's really good to just um, learn a little bit about art history. You know, um, go to go to museums. You know, um, as mu- it's like as much as you intake that you should also be, um, or as much as your output should be, you should mm-hmm. be intaking just as much as that it's the balance between them that I think helps inform what you do. Um, yeah. And it helps you grow as an artist, helps you grow as a person, right. um, and right. among so many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean, I think that's a great advice for, for really anyone that's looking to get started in something, um, no matter what kind of medium they're working with. And I just have to say that going back to your earlier comment about creating a tapestry of history and a tapestry of your artistry, I think it's very apparent how well you do that, not just in this novel, but in the way that you think or in the way that you're um, that you're framing your questions. It's not just it's not just one thing. It is so many myriad of things that influence what you do. Um, So I really have to thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, as far uh, for our audience that would like to stay in touch with you, um, are, do you have any social media that you would like to uh, that you're most active on that you'd like to uh, promote? Oh yeah, um, sure. I'm I'm on uh, Instagram and uh, do I? Let's see here. You know, I don't even know what my uh, it's. Uh, I've got the two links as well. Oh, you got those on there, okay? Yeah, okay. on Instagram it's Sean P Fitzgibbon, and on Facebook it's Sean Fitzgibbon Art. There we go. Easy enough. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I've got my website, and then on my website I also have a uh, just Sean Fitzgibbon or Sean Fitzgibbon Art dot com, and then uh, there's a newsletter on there, and so. Oh and, yeah. And I also have, I also have a store on there if anyone's interested in picking up a copy of the book. Excellent. Um, yeah. Uh, I was actually checking out some of the prints that were on there and they oh. look incredible. Oh, so yeah. um, there is a phenomenal poster card, pa- um, postcard postcard pack. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know English. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there's you can also get an incredible slipcase edition of what follows is true crescent hotel um, from uh, Sean Fitzgibbon uh, from his store so please go check out his store please go share some love uh, this is I, I really do look forward to the next uh, the next book Sean oh thank you very yeah. much yeah I good luck with that <laughs> thank you this has been fun uh, yeah so as we close out tonight's podcast, uh, we just want to say that this podcast and every other podcast that we have is always going to be dedicated to our admirer, encourager, um, producer, and friend. Uh, oh my gosh, Mr. Caponis, Mr. Joe Capone, uh, that we do raise glass to in every podcast here. So please raise glass right. if you haven't. He would um, love this episode. He would love oh. your artwork. This is totally up his alley, and I'm, we're sad that he is not here anymore to enjoy it. But um, we're doing it on his behalf, so here we are. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so <laughs> for us here, um, we are pretty much on every podcast outlet available. Um, please check us out wherever you uh, currently subscribe to podcasts um, and help us meet our subscriber goal. Uh, thank you to our moderators. Listen for free wherever you get, uh, listen, get, acquire, attain, plunder, stealthily steal, or download your podcasts. 
Um, thank you so much for tuning in today and um, have a tapestry kind of day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks.